From historic downtown Waco, deep in the heart of Texas, this is First Sunday Morning, a ministry of the First Baptist Church of Waco. A part of our community, celebrating fellowship together and sharing ministry with others through the timeless good news of the gospel story of new life in Christ Jesus.
I'd like to invite the children to join me for the children's message. Good morning, everybody. How are you? I want to show you a picture. Look, look at this picture. This is a really old picture, an old black and white picture. Do you see this pretty girl in the sunglasses? She's going to turn 93 years old Tuesday. This is my grandmother, Rita, and this is my grandfather, Charlie. And this is when they were teenagers. They became best friends in the third grade. They were seated alphabetically. Her last name was Richardson and his was Snowden. They became buddies in the third grade, and they were best buddies all through school. When he was drafted during World War II, uh, she proposed to him. <laughs> and they eloped on Christmas Eve. They got married on Christmas Eve. And they were married for 69 years, almost 70 years, when my grandfather passed away. Uh, they were, have been all my life my example of how to love one another. Uh, they loved each other sacrificially and beautifully, uh, and I have taken a lot of lessons from them. And I think about my grandmother uh, on her birthday because it's on Valentine's Day, and I think they're the greatest love story that I know. Uh, but you know what is interesting about them? It wasn't so much their love for each other uh, that I remember, but they also taught me how much God loves us and how we are to love God. And because of God's love for us and our love for God, then we are free to love each other uh, well, to love each other right. Today we're going to talk about what the Bible teaches us about love, about God's love for us and our love for God, and about how we are to love one another and the world because of His love. And I want you to listen and pay attention to that. The whole world's talking about love right now. It's just that time. But you want to have love in your heart that's uh, defined by Scripture. So we're going to talk about that later today. Will you listen? You promise? All right, very good. Let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you so much for these kids. Lord, I pray that we live before them in such a way that your love makes sense. Lord, help us to be examples of love, both in receiving love from you and in returning love to you in worship and devotion and in love for one another. Lord, we thank you for those examples around us that show us how to love. Help us to follow their example through your grace and through the power of your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You have a great morning. Love you guys.
Please join me in the responsive reading. I will read the light print. Please follow with the bold. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor right, nor death, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for all that you have done for us. Thank you for allowing us to gather together this morning as a church family to worship and praise you. Thank you for a church family that loves and supports one another. And thank you for the many gifts, talents, and abilities you have blessed each of us with. As we give our tithes and offerings today, please use them to continue the work of the church here in Waco and all around the world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Let us pray. Our good and our holy God, we thank you for this day of worship. And we are grateful for your word. Lord, as we open it together, my prayer is that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray in the strong name of Jesus, saying together, amen. Please be seated. And as you find your seat, I invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Colossians. Today we are in the sermon series, Flourishing. We are talking about the fruit of the Spirit and how God's Spirit manifests the characteristics of Christ in our life as we grow in our relationship with Him. And today our focus is on love. Paul wrote in Galatians that the thing that matters, the one thing that really counts is faith expressing itself in love. Some would argue that all of the fruit of the Spirit can be summed up as love. And that joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness, these are manifestations of the love of God in Christ Jesus. Today we turn to Colossians because I believe Colossians is a book that fleshes out a godly, healthy understanding of what love is is and what love is not. The book of Colossians is a book written uh, about the supremacy of Christ, about the majesty and sufficiency of Jesus Christ, which means it's a book about love. Paul writes this letter to encourage a church and to challenge an assault on the church that would fuzzy things up And that would muddy the waters in their concept of what life and love was all about. So today I want us to walk through some passages from Colossians. And I will encourage you this week to read the whole book. You can read it in just a little while. It doesn't take long at all. But read Colossians and let the words just sort of wash over your heart and mind. uh, With your eye turned toward manifesting the love of God in your life. Flourishing in love. Let's begin reading in chapter 1, verse 1. We'll go on down to about verse 8. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, When we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all God's people, the faith and love that spring from the hope stored up for you in heaven, about which you have already heard in the true message of the gospel that has come to you. In the same way, the gospel is bearing fruit and growing throughout the whole world world, just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and truly understood God's grace. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. In opening lines, Paul is identifying himself He's writing to them. He's talking about what he'd heard about them. He talked about the fact that the gospel was being preached throughout the world, that it was bearing fruit, that it was flourishing, if you will. The message of hope, the message of life, God in Christ, Christ reconciling the world unto himself, Christ being the all in all. This wonderful message of God demonstrating his love to us through Jesus Christ. He says, I know you've heard this. I've, oh, you've heard this, and it's taken root in your life, and you're being changed by this. He said, I've heard rumors of your love, your love for one another, your love for the church. I know of your love. I heard about this from Epaphras. What about Epaphras? What a name. Wouldn't you love to be named Epaphras? That'd be a cool name, wouldn't it? Uh, the smart people tell us that, that Epaphras has at its roots the name Aphrodite. 
the great goddess of love. What do we know about Epaphras? Not just tons, but we know probably because of this that he was a convert from a pagan background. We know that he helped start this church and he had a love for them. He was writing to them. So here's this guy named after the goddess of love who was raised probably with a certain understanding of love and what it was about. And that understanding was being radically transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, when I hear things about Aphrodite and Cupid and Eros, a cold sweat breaks out on me. Because when I was at Magnolia Middle School, middle school, write that down, middle school, we were studying Edith Hamilton's mythology. Remember that great book? And, and in order to be a creative teacher, our teacher decided that we would act out some of the myths, Greco-Roman myths. Uh, and on one day of class, we came in and we were given our assignment. And we were to go home and we were to give these assignments to our parents and they were to help us dress for the occasion. And on the appropriate day, we would come and we would act out our great miss. I drew the lot of playing Eros or Cupid. I took this assignment back to my mother and she did what every frugal mother would do. She just went to the closet and started putting together an outfit for me. And so what I wound up with was thermal underwear, the white ones, you know, and a massive pink loincloth she borrowed a compound bow from one of my dad's friends, the kind you hunt deer with. And I was shipped off to school dressed like this. It looked like Tinkerbell had had a child with Ted Nugent. It was awful. Uh, I should have used every one of my free counseling sessions from college just unpacking this moment in my life. Can you imagine being a middle school kid going to school in thermal underwear, a pink loincloth, carrying a compound bow? <laughs> Nowadays, I would be arrested just for showing up with the compound bow. <laughs> but we learn those stories, those Greco-Roman stories of love. They were really stories about jealousy and power and grasping and grabbing and pleasure simply for pleasure's sake. Yet for thousands of years, it was called love. And it still is. And here's a guy named after all that stuff whose life is being radically transformed by the gospel and by God who is called in Scripture, love. Who labored to see this church born. Who was concerned because alternatives to this life-transforming love of God were being oppressed upon the people. And he writes to Paul, he writes to Paul to tell them they got the good stuff. They, they've heard, they've been transformed, they've been touched by the gospel. They manifest the love of God toward God and toward others, but they're in a bind. Would you write to them? Would you write to them? They're experiencing love as he qualifies it here in the spirit, but I want to shore it up. I want to make sure they continue to walk in this, to be defined by this, to grow in this, to flourish in this. And so Paul, his friend, takes pen in hand and he eloquently writes about Jesus, the majestic supreme one who came among us, love incarnate, and about our response to him. This morning, as we think about love, Christ-like, godly love, let us think about love as Paul wrote to this church in, in Turkey and learn from the lessons he shared with them because these lessons are as current and as fresh as this morning's do. They're for us in this place, in this time, right now. 
today, I would suggest there's three aspects or characteristics of love in the Spirit. And the primary one, and the one we'll begin with, is that God loves us. In chapter 3, verse 12, Paul writes to this church, and he calls them God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. Beloved means you're really, really loved. You're dearly loved. You're deeply loved. He said, look, you're God's chosen ones, holy, set apart, special, and you are beloved. In verse 11, the, the verse that came just before this one, verse 12, it talked about in, in Christ there is, there is no Greek or Jew. There's no free or slave. There's no male or female. There's no barbarian, Scythian. Uh, there, these categories, these categories are, are secondary to the great category of Christ. He said Christ is all in all and those who are in Christ. Those who are part of life and God in Christ, they're chosen and beloved. This is the way scripture talks about Israel, a people of the covenant. And here Paul is, is talking to these Christians in this little town in Turkey. And he says, you have trusted Christ. You've been transformed by his grace. That makes you a child of God's stubborn, relentless covenant love. You are the chosen people of God, holy and beloved. This is where it starts for us. It starts with God's covenant of grace and mercy. It starts with God's love being shown to us. This love is broad and this love is narrow. It is universal and it is particular. The message of Christ in chapter 1, verse 6, is for the whole world. It bears fruit all over the world. And it's found in Jesus. Jesus looked at a religious leader many years ago, and he said, God so loved the what? World. That he gave his one of a kind, only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him, would not perish, but would live, really, really live. And those that believe on him, those that trust him, those that receive this, this gift of grace offered freely by God, they become the community of his heart, the beloved. Friends, do you know deep in your heart that you are loved, deeply, deeply loved by God. If I said, are you the beloved of God? Would you be able to humbly yet confidently affirm that yes, yes I am. And I feel that deep, deep down. This is where genuine love begins. Not in giving, but in receiving. You might notice that we have a new piano on the stage today. This piano is a gift from a family to honor a beloved member of their family. And we'll make that public and we'll talk about that openly next week. But it's a symbol, a gracious symbol of love. I was here late Friday afternoon when it was being delivered, and David and I were talking on the porch as these big, strong men were bringing this piano into the room. You can't move a piano if you're a little bitty person. Piano movers are big people. These guys were huge, and they were just carrying this piano in. And I was talking with David. I said, David, you know, it's really important that we decide the first song played on this piano in this room. I think it'll set the tone. We need to talk about that now. And, uh, and so we just sat there and, and thought for a minute. And David said, hey, oh, how he loves you and me, works for me. How about you? That was a gift from a friend to a friend. But it was also a wise, wise decision. Because God's love 
must be primary if we are to be the loving people of God in this world. Without that, we're just worn out activists. Without that, we're just mean old religious people. Without that, we're just chasing after casseroles. Without that, we're just a rotary club with better music. And I love civic organizations, but there's something unique and different about the church of God. And what's unique and different is at the core of the church of God is the love of God fleshed out in Jesus. The first song we should sing every time we sing is about the amazing love of God and oh, how much he loves us. So my question today on this February morning is do you sense that in the marrow of your bones? You can, and that hope will make all the difference. The second one is that God is the source of all Christian love. Go ahead and write that down in pen. God is the source of all Christian love. Throughout this book, Paul highlights alternatives to God being the source of life and faith and love. And there are three big ones that I would highlight because I think we need to know the counterfeit sometimes before we deal with the genuine. He gives this as an alternative, human wisdom and tradition. In chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, he, talk, he talks about being deceived through fine-sounding arguments, things we talk about, things that make sense. You go to any self-help section of any bookstore, and there'll be fine-sounding arguments trying to tell you how to love people, and more often than not, how to be loved by people. It's like we go around with all these holes that need to be filled in, and people will give you strategies for how to manipulate those relationships that you're in so that all your itches are scratched in all of the appropriate kind of ways. All around you, at every turn, somebody will tell you what it means to be loving and to be loved. You turn on television, there are people who are talking about it. And so often, the advice that we're given are nothing more than Cupid's arrows being hurled through the universe one more time. One more way to game the system. One more way to win. One more way to acquire. That's not love. A second alternative is secret knowledge. He says in chapter 2, verse 18, he talks about false humility and worship with angels. Secret knowledge. There'll be people all the time who say, well, I know this is what, what, what the Scripture teaches us about love, but perhaps we could think about it this way. Or God told me this. You ever had that? Matt, I know the scripture says that, but, but you got to understand what the Spirit told me. As if God has changed his mind. This slippery slope that we get in, this new gnosis that comes around. It's as old as the hills. And that's not love. So when you've promised your love to someone... I remember watching an episode of the 700 Club. And they called in and they asked Pat. I don't normally criticize people by name, but this is worth it. (laughs) And they asked Pat, "My, my wife has Alzheimer's. What should I do? And he gives a reasoned argument for putting her away and continuing on in life. And he did it in the name of the Lord. You say, that's egregious and that's huge. It's common as table salt because we can always find secret knowledge for doing precisely what we want to do. When I saw that clip, it was sent to me by a friend. 
I immediately thought of some men that are in this room right now. And I thought about their day by day commitment to love because they'd been loved by God and they'd promised their love. And friends, it makes a difference. A, a, third, a third alternative is some type of ceremonialism. You get that in chapter 2, verses 16 to 17. Some people say, well, what are we going to do if we're going to love God? We just got to hit the marks. We just got to hit the marks. We just got to put those feet on the, on the ground, and we got to learn how to dance. We got to do this and that and the other. But we can be as religious as the next guy and never taste the love of God if all it's about is the ceremony and hitting the mark. These alternatives to real love fleshed out in Christ, they've been around for a long, long time, and they're on the scene now, but we can do it a different way. And that's what this text is about. That's why when Paul wrote Galatians 5, 22, 23, the fruit of the Spirit was love. This love manifests itself in our life. It comes from God. This is why love springs from the hope that we have. That's Colossians 1 verse 5. Where does love come from? Love springs up from the gospel, from the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. One of the most powerful declarations of this is in the fifth chapter of Romans, where Paul says this in Romans 5 verse 5. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given us. Where does love come from? It comes from God pouring himself into us. Bonhoeffer talked about an alien righteousness being the hope of our life together. And an alien love is a hope for our life together. A love that comes from outside. Teresa of Avila prayed one of the most ruggedly beautiful prayers I've ever read. She said, God, I don't love you. I don't want to love you, but I want to want to love you. And it was there in that threadbare honesty before God that the love of God was poured into our life by the Holy Spirit who God has given us. She was aware that in her own frailty, she could not love as God had called her to love. She couldn't love God. She couldn't love herself. She couldn't love anybody else. And we've got to come to that place, too, where we can't just wing it. We've got to come to that, that powerless place before God where we have to ask him to fill us because we're empty. Where we have to ask him to empower us to love because we can't love on our own. And what an image Paul gave. He said God poured his love into us through the Holy Spirit. This is an image we all understand. Every day, I begin my day at the office in the break room. Hey, let's get it started right. I come in, I put my satchel down, I plug in my computer, and I go to the break room, and I look down into the bottom of an empty coffee cup. That's a sad image, an empty coffee cup. And I take that empty coffee cup, and I go to the urn, and I fill it. And then I pour that coffee into me, and then we get going. And I do that another time at about 10 o'clock. And then after lunch, when I come back from lunch, I start drinking water. I go with my little glass to the water cooler, and I fill it up. Last week, last Monday, in fact, I drank the best glass of water I've had in my entire life. I came home at night, and I told Meredith, I said, Meredith, if we ever get on one of those uh, dating shows or married games where we have to know things about each other, I said, and they ask you, what, what is the best glass of water I've ever had? I've just had it. Let me tell you about it, because I want us to win this. <laughs> the whole day, I'd been talking. I'd been in meetings. I'd been talking all day long. I had nothing left. I was parched. On the way home, I went by to see our friend Phyllis Dunham in the hospice. 
went down and I sat and I talked with Cecil for a good while. We just sat, Phyllis, we talked to Phyllis a little bit. Uh, and, and when I left the room, I felt like I had been chewing the cotton out of the top of the Tylenol bottle. I had nothing left. And I walked outside of the room, and there was this big, beautiful pot of water. And above it, it said, infused water. I thought, man, that sounds fun. Let's figure out what that is. And I went, and there was a little sign, and they were offering free water to anyone to come. Uh, and, it, and it tasted like pineapples and mint. And it was the coldest water I'd ever had. I just took that empty cup and I filled it up and I poured it in me. And I felt so alive. When it comes to love, we got to know that we're parched people. And that God offers us life freely. And that he'll pour his love into us. All for the asking. All for the asking. God loves us. God is the source of all love. And finally, we must clothe ourselves in love. Let's look in chapter 3 and read uh, from 10 down to 14. And now put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, city, and slave are free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. Bear with each other. And forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. I'm looking around this room today, and I see something that is rare. I see that we have all agreed perfectly, perfectly on one thing. Look around. You know what we agreed on? That clothing is not an option. <laughs> now, there are some beaches you can go to in this world where clothing is optional. But you all recognized as you walked into the room today that clothing was not an option here. That you had to wear it. And so somewhere very recently, you put on the clothes that you are wearing. I would say it was this morning, but some of you may have slept in your clothes. I don't know. But sometime recently, you put on some clothes and you showed up. Paul puts the cookies on the lowest shelf when he talks about life together and living in love. He says, it's like putting on clothes. We learned it in our earliest stages of life, right as we began to learn what it meant to be naked for a while, our mamas and daddies put clothes on us, and then we determined that we were naked. And we decided we'd put clothes on ourselves, and we would walk into this world with clothes on. And sometimes when we take off clothes and put on clothes, it means something incredibly significant. Some of you are medical doctors. Can you go back to the time you put that white coat on for the first time? How'd you feel? Some of you, when you graduated with your PhD, somebody put a, a robe on you and, and they put a hood on you. And those clothes made you feel differently, didn't they? Some of you can go back to the moment where in some locker room, in some high school, you wept like a little girl because you took your jersey off for the last time. I can see you back there. Clothes are symbolic of things. And Paul said, we have taken off the old self with its sinful grabbing and love defined in warped ways as arrows flying of acquiring and clutching. And we've put on new clothes. And we must continually clothe ourselves with these new sets of clothes given to us by God. And he talked about this ensemble. He talked about putting on compassion and kindness, and humility, and gentleness, and patience. And he says, if anyone has a grievance, uh, this is how you are to treat it. You are to forgive 
as the Lord. That little qualifier could be used for all those virtues. Be compassionate as the Lord was compassionate toward you. Be kind as the Lord was kind toward you. Be long-suffering as the Lord has been patient with you. Put on these clothes. And he says, and above on, put on love, which ties all these virtues together as the integrating theme. Colossians is about the supremacy and the majesty of Christ as the integrating theme of the universe. Christ will be there or something else will be. And the leading candidate is the self. And we're called to very intentionally put off the self and clothe ourselves in the virtues of Jesus. As we have received from him, we are freely to give. So today on this day where we think about love, let me ask you this. Do you know the love of God in your heart of hearts? Let me say to you, it's possible. You may have given up hope of the possibility of that, but it is indeed possible. He will pour his love and his life into you if you will crack your heart open just the tiniest bit. Do you know the love of God in Christ? And if your answer to that is yes, do you freely give as you have freely received? Are you compassionate and kind and long-suffering? Do you forgive as you have been forgiven by God in Christ. Only you can answer those questions. The rest of us have a good hunch, but only you can answer those questions. What will you do with the God of love today? What will you do? Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for a chance to to think about you and and the life of love you've called us to. So often, Lord, we define that in ways that are self-serving. Lord, forgive us. And Lord, we pray that you would empower us through your spirit to, to clothe ourselves in the virtue of Christ's love. Lord, pour your love in our hearts through your spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I invite you to stand if you have made decisions in your heart this week that you believe God would have you make publicly. We invite you to come and pray as we all sing together. Uh, David, come and lead us.
immediately to my left is Kevin Malone. Uh, Kevin is a history major at Baylor from Missouri and is looking to transfer his letter of membership to First Baptist Waco. Then I have Richard and Linda Reeder. Uh, I didn't hear, where are y'all from? Salina, uh, Salina, Texas. I've never heard of that one. Uh, but coming to again to transfer their letter to First Baptist Waco and then Joao Morales. Am I getting that close? It's from Brazil studying religion at Baylor and all are coming to transfer their letter to First Baptist Waco. Uh, they will be a part of our church family. So I'd ask that you would join me in welcoming them by saying amen. 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 Yeah, I'm gonna, I will ask that y'all stay up here and the rest of the church family will come and greet y'all whenever we finish. And Caroline is coming up to do the benediction. Dear Lord, thank you for this morning of worship with other Christians. Thank you for loving us and showing us how to love. Please be with us as we go throughout our day. Help us to be a light of Christian love to those around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. <laughs> 